Since the turn of the 21st century, China's economic growth has soared, such that it is now vying with the U.S. for top spot in the world's economic order. It's a dynamic, entrepreneur-driven economy with a burgeoning consumer class. And with a population approaching a billion and a half, that means ripples and realignment across that country. Joining us now to reflect on China's remarkable rise, David Mulroney. He is former Canadian ambassador to China and author of Middle Power, Middle Kingdom, What Canadians Need to Know About China in the 21st Century. And Diana Fu is here. She is assistant professor of Asian politics at the University of Toronto, author of Mobilizing Without the Masses, Control and Contention in China, and host of TVO series that starts tonight, China, Here and Now. And we are delighted to welcome you, Thank Ambassador, you back to our television station and you here and now for the first time. Thank you. Lovely to have you here. Let us, just to get our conversation kick-started here, look at a little clip uh, about the magic of e-commerce in China today. Sheldon, go. This is the village of Shangwang in Jiangxi province. It is one of the places that didn't enjoy the benefits of the economic boom and has no adequate water supply facilities. The young people have left to work in the cities and the remaining 500 or so older people in the village get by on their own means. They couldn't shop because there were no stores. But in 2015, a service center for online shopping was opened here. Together with e-commerce companies, the government set up this market where online orders can be placed. About 40,000 of these e-marketplaces have been established around China, mainly in inland villages. So here we've got buying and selling and creating and digitizing and uh, investing. It seems like a regular capitalist society, but with, as the Chinese like to say, Chinese characteristics. How is this experienced by millions of peasants who were excluded from commercial life in the pre-digital China? Yeah, I mean, this is a really good question. I think the digital revolution in China has profoundly changed everyday life for a lot of people in China, especially for rural people. As you saw in the video and in the documentary tonight, um, these are people who are poor. They live in the hinterlands of China. They don't have access to malls, right? Mm. And so before the digital revolution, they didn't have a range of uh, goods that they could buy. But now if they go to the service center or some people just with a few clicks on their phones, they can order the latest fashion t-shirts. They can order the latest gadgets. And this is really profoundly changing their lives. And it might not seem, I think it might not seem really remarkable to those of us who are used to buying stuff from Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it's really, it's really a, a big shift because opening up the rural market in China is like, kind of like discovering an, a gold mine. And it's made some people very, very wealthy. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Jack Ma, uh, who has basically become China's national uh, commerce, e-commerce hero because he owns Alibaba. He's stepping down soon though, isn't he? I, I yeah, but he is, you know what? He is the 20, uh, he is the top 20 richest people in the world. So hmm. if he is stepping down, he's in very, he's, he's very okay. well healed. We'll have to have any uh, tag <laughs> yes, days for very, him. he's very, very well healed. Let's put some numbers on this then, Diana. Here we go. Sheldon, you wanna bring this graphic up here? The e-commerce phenomenon in China, 731 million of China's 1.4 billion citizens use the internet, about half. Of global e-commerce, China accounts for 42%. 10 years ago, it was 1%. You wanna talk about massive growth. Uh, this is a country, David, that has changed in ways we cannot imagine over the past few decades. What is it about China that makes that possible? Well, I, I was thinking as you were quoting that, um, when I first served in China in the mid 80s, my co-workers, we, we were operating out of a, a house in the suburbs of Shanghai that was for the time being the Consulate General of Canada. We reopened it in, in 86. And they'd spend they'd hours commuting. Uh, they then have to do the shopping for the family in stores that were unfriendly and poorly supplied. And that's all changed. And one of the things China's done really well is, is you know, what's referred to as leapfrogging. So when I was in, in China, in the, the first time around, it was really hard to make a, a, a telephone call to the embassy in Beijing. People didn't have phones and they'd live in, in vast tenements and there'd be a, a couple of phones that everybody would use. But instead of installing the phone infrastructure that we have in North America, they went cellular. What's happening in retail is instead of building a Walmart in every village, 
you're going, you're, you're shopping online, and you're you have really smart, very sophisticated delivery services that will now include drone deliveries. So they they leapfrog whole areas of technology to to sort of get out into the the forefront. It, it's really remarkable. Does their authoritarian, capitalist nature of government make this possible in a way that? maybe we can't do in a democratic society. To an extent it does, uh, in that regulations are um, there to be obeyed until someone isn't looking. So there was a little bit of nudge, nudge, wink, wink that's allowed many uh, entrepreneurs to rise to the top. That's changing a little bit right now under President Xi Jinping, uh, for, because the anti-corruption campaign is now shining a light on some of those areas that allowed people to flourish. And the absence of regulation in some of these sectors is, is problematic. Let's do another graphic here, again, showing some of the wealth that you just, Diana, talked about a moment ago. Here we go, Sheldon, thanks. As of 2017, China had what are called unicorns, 164 unicorns. These are privately held startups valued at more than a billion dollars, valued at 628 billion U.S. By comparison, the U.S. had 132 unicorns valued at 700 billion U.S., Today, China counts 338 billionaires. It is the second largest national grouping after the U.S., which has about twice as many, 680 billionaires. Uh, billionaires, I th well, not universally, but obviously there are a lot of people in the United States who admire billionaires for what they've been able to accomplish. Do they feel the same way in China about their billionaires there? That's a great question, and it really depends on who you ask, right? If you ask them average Chinese people. I mean, I remember a decade ago, there was a sociologist at Harvard, Martin White, did a, a, a survey. And surprisingly, people are quite tolerant of wealth inequality. And, and it might seem kind of ironic, right, because this is a communist country. And you think of communism and think, well, people want equality. But of so, outcome. Yeah, equality of outcome, equality of wealth, equality mm -hmm. in life. Mm -hmm. But um, and in my own experience, living in China and having relatives in China and friends in China, people don't really have that much of a problem with wealth inequality. They're more concerned with getting rich, getting successful, the entrepreneurial spirit. So the sense is if they could do it, maybe I can too? Maybe, yeah. Which used yeah. to be the case in the United States, David. You used to think, well, if they got rich, maybe I can too. There's a lot more envy about the rich today, I suspect. Um, there's more, in, I, I mean, according to the figures I have, there's more income inequality in China than there is in the United States today, which is shocking. Is equality not valued in China today in the way maybe it once was 30, 40 years ago? I, I think that's one of the challenges that the Communist Party is facing, and it's that rampant inequality. It's one of the greatest changes I saw in my lifetime, where despite all the problems I mentioned in, in, that I saw in China when I served there in the mid-'80s, there was a, an equality, there was an egalitarian side to society that it was, was actually quite admirable, and that, that has changed. One of the things that has prevented this from becoming a major issue is that it's, it's geographically, the, the, the two classes are geographically separated. So if you're in Shanghai or Beijing or uh, down in Guangzhou, um, in Guangdong province, you know, there are a lot of wealthy people and, and the, the shopping malls are, uh, you know, almost overwhelming in, in terms of their opulence. But when you push inland, and, and we saw something of that in, in terms of the, the village where the old people live, um, it's not as apparent. That's changing slowly, and this will, this will be a political pressure for the party to address. I should ask a millennial a question about millennials. <laughs> does, the, I mean, does the word communism mean anything to millennials in China today? Yeah, I think, you know, millennials today think of communism more in an instrumental fashion, right? You join the party not necessarily because you believe in communism, but because you want to advance. You want to signal that you are on the right side of politics, that you're a good citizen, and that's why you join the Communist Party. Now, there is a term, actually, uh, to refer to the millennial generation in China today. They're called the Zen generation. Why? Because everything's kind of blase. Everything's basic. And they're not so super politically engaged. And so I have a hard time thinking that these people that of the Zen generation are all that concerned with communism. They're probably more concerned about taking selfies and posting it on WeChat. Oh, my goodness. Now, when you were there, would, would a young person have taken that approach to, to the word communism or the, the, what, what it meant to be a communist back then? When I was first there, no. I mean, it was, it was very serious. Um, this was pre-Tiananmen, uh, uh, which happened in 89. Um, that changed everything. And it, it uh, sent the party into uh, more than a decade of, of trying to figure out what had happened, what had caused society to, to almost to collapse, what had happened, what, what had caused the political system almost to collapse. So they they widened the party 
uh, greatly. They allowed all kinds of people, including entrepreneurs, to become party members. Uh, the party went from, you know, several million to 70 million. Um, and they, they decided that instead of having a democracy as we have it, uh, you know, we're, we're, we have different parties contesting, they would have what they call intra-party democracy, dem mm -hmm. democracy inside the party. So you could debate really key issues. I mean, we sometimes think that they don't debate things in China. They do. There are people who are uh, climate, who worry about climate change and are environmentalists, mm -hmm. and there are industrialists who say, no, we've got to keep the economy growing at this level, and, you know, we're going to have to, you know, cut some corners here and there. But these parties happen within the party. Uh, these these uh, debates happen within, within the, party. the party. And then once they're settled, they're settled. Mm -hmm. And I, I think Diana's absolutely right. In, in, you know, I'd meet people who were joining the party, like you'd join a service club here or get on a board. It, it helps your, your CV, but people don't take it seriously. And, and the party, I think, recognizes this. And their, their deal with the Chinese people is, we will provide uh, stability. You're going to get health care. You're going to get education. Uh, you're going to get uh, your own condo. Uh, and in return, we'll, we'll take care of the government. It's like that old slogan from when I was young where the, the bus company said, leave the driving to us. Hmm. For the Communist Party, it's leave the governance to us, and things are going to be okay otherwise. And so far, that, that, that's worked. Well, of course, it does raise the question, what if you don't want to leave the driving to us? And that gets us, want to move our conversation now into something. We actually, it's funny, they had the same expression in Canada many decades ago, social credit. There was a government in British Columbia called the social credit government. Mm -hmm. This is very different. I'd like you to explain to us this new and hugely controversial approach they're taking in China called social credit. What is it? Yeah, I mean, the social credit system is, is new to all of us, and it's, it is indeed controversial. And what it is is that you have to understand that China has gone through so much rapid change that everybody in society is facing common problems, like consumer scams, right? They, they go online, they buy something, they get cheated. Or they're facing someone who behaving, behaving very badly in public. And so what the social credit system does is it punishes people that are bad citizens. It punishes companies that are cheating consumers by deducting points. And conversely, if you do something good, like get a good citizenship award, it, you, you get points and for it. And you can literally look on your smartphone and see your social credit score, right? I, I don't know about yeah, that. You I, 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 I've, I, I've yeah, you can. I've seen it. You so, have, okay. Yeah. Um, what do you have to do that's bad in order to have your score reduced? There can be a number of things. You can violate traffic laws. So that seems okay that, yeah, no one wants to violate traffic laws and, and we all want to know who's violating traffic laws. But there are other, a little bit more worrying things that you can get deducted for, such as criticizing the government online. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what worries um, some observers looking at the social credit system. When this is fully implemented, it is going to kind of, you know, reach tentacles into many, many aspects of the average Chinese person's life. They think at the end of the day it will create a more harmonious society. What do you think? Well, uh, that's the really interesting thing about it. We, we tend to think again in terms of the state and the people. But social credit is something that is being implemented throughout the Chinese society and throughout the economy. So that if you, for example, had a meltdown on an airplane, you were mad about you know, having to line up or not getting your seat, and that I used to see that happen on a weekly basis, then uh, the airline recognizes you when you go to check in. You might not get a ticket. Uh, on, on your next flight. So banks and airlines and service providers, your, the Uber equivalent in China uh, mm -hmm. could recognize this. So uh, people are going to feel the difference. And as, as Diana said, this concern about a breakdown of you know, sort of civic behavior, civic decency, mm -hmm. is very real. So that's, that's the semi-positive side of this. Mm -hmm. But if you marry this capacity to things that we're seeing now, such as incredible advances in things like facial recognition technology. Mm -hmm. You have, you're handing uh, the powers that be tremendous, tremendous control over the, the society. And we're seeing the really negative, sinister application of this in the far west of China, in Xinjiang, where about a million of the Muslim Uyghur people there are now in re-education camps. Mm -hmm. And China is using this mix of technology and tracking people individually uh, to exert a degree of social control that we haven't seen before. Yeah, well, I mean, we would not, at least I think we would not put up with this in the West where there are literally 200 million cameras across the country taking the most sophisticated pictures of people walking in daily life and, you know, tracking their personal information. Here's, I want to just steal a quote from a column you wrote earlier this summer, which contained the following. When we talk about human rights, we're arrogantly insisting on the adoption of, a, of an agenda that reflects the worldview and biases of the secular West. 
Privacy and individual freedom are Western values. Should we put these values, should we in the West be putting these values aside when we think about the political control that is obviously part and parcel of social credit? No, I think there are certain commonly held uh, ideas in, in terms of people's um, rights to privacy and, and um, rights to a degree of a political freedom that we shouldn't uh, set aside. It's how we express them. And when we express them in purely Western terms, we often say, and there's an argument in China that democracy is a Western construct. Mm -hmm. Well, a place like Taiwan puts the lie to that. But Taiwanese democracy developed in Taiwanese terms. And, and there are Democrats in China. There was a democratic past in China that developed in purely Chinese Chinese terms. So we have to be prepared to understand how it's expressed and what the solutions are that the Chinese find. But the ideas like democracy and privacy are, are acceptable and, and should, be, uh, should be protected wherever you live. What's your take on that, Diana? Yeah, I, you know, a colleague of mine, um, Genya Koska, recently did a survey asking Chinese people what they think of the social credit system. And she found a whopping 80% of respondents to the survey actually support it. These they are don't see Chinese, Chinese citizens, citizens who, eighty percent of whom approve approve of the, of the government credit system being in the most intimate details of their lives. Yes, and the reason for that, I think, I was puzzling over, and I think you know what? It's not that surprising because most people are not political dissidents or activists. Most people aren't that concerned about having the freedom to go online to criticize the government. They're concerned about not being cheated when they go on Taobao and buy something. Hmm. I would like to, uh, with your permission, uh, introduce a new voice to our conversation here tonight on TVO. Michael Sony is joining us from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Michael is the director of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies at Harvard University and co-editor of The China Questions, Critical Insights into a Rising Power. Michael, we thank you very much for joining us. We should say, even though you're in Cambridge, Massachusetts, you're a Canuck, you're one of us, <laughs> and we are delighted to welcome you to our conversation. Can, can I um, start by asking you how you think old China is responding to this new digital China that we have been talking about tonight on TVO? Sure. Well, let me just first apologize for being late. It was a technical glitch, and this would never have happened in China. <laughs> <laughs> now, why do you say that? That's interesting. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, 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 sure that, I'm sure that there are problems with video feeds in China as well. But one of the things that is really striking, and I'm sure this is something that David notices all the time, is, is just the incredible technical sophistication of life, life in China today. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the one aspect of the, of the digital economy that, that didn't come up is the way China is increasingly becoming a cashless society. Um, the uh, people like me, and I'm sure like Diana, we compete with our stories of what's the thing we are able to do with our phones that is unimaginable uh, in Canada. Uh, this summer, I was able to give money to a panhandler, to a beggar on the street by transferring funds from my cell phone. Uh, the, uh, I was able to order an ice cream cone uh, with uh, an ice cream cone delivered uh, using, my, using my cell phone. What I think is really interesting is that the authoritarian party uh, is confident that it has refined its technology as fast as, David mentioned, leapfrogging. Uh, the control technology is moving as fast as the digital, as the general digital technology. So I don't get a sense that the, the party and the party leadership is at all concerned that this is leading to a loss of control. As you were talking about earlier with relation to the social credit system, in fact, they are refining their mechanisms of social control to adjust to a digital society. And is it your sense as well, Michael, that, um, that the average Chinese citizen actually doesn't have any issue with the social credit system in a way that, say, if any government in Canada or the United States were to try to implement something like that, we'd be up in arms, presumably? Right. Well, I want to I want to first uh, refine a little bit the previous conversation about the social credit system. A lot of the um, uh, media uh, accounts of it in the West uh, suggest that life in China is becoming like an episode from Black Mirror. Um, the the reality is that there are different pilot programs happening in different parts of China. Some of the most uh, alarming of those are are the ones that get highlighted in the news. But we all have credit scores, right? The uh, the 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 banks. Uh, keep an account of whether we've paid our debts, whether we pay our credit card systems. Um, there's no great objection to that in Canada. There's similarly no great objection to that in China. In China, it's actually more important because of the amount of, uh, to come back to something Diana was talking about, about trust, because of the amount of lending 
that is done peer to peer online, it's really important that I know your credit score because uh, I might be lending you money. Uh, similarly, one of the things that a lot of people really appreciate about the social credit uh, system is uh, it's intended to incentivize good behavior, as you talked about. One of those good behaviors is if you lose in a court case and you owe somebody some money as a result of a, a lawsuit, the social credit system penalizes you very, very heavily if you don't pay. Uh, in other words, it's a, it's a system that serves to ensure that legal judgments are fulfilled. Most people are much more concerned about those kinds of issues than about uh, the implications for their ability to articulate political views that are different than the government. I, I will also say the really worrying thing is, as David mentioned, um, the use of this surveillance technology and, and new forms of AI and big data for uh, the suppression of ordinary Chinese citizens, as we're seeing uh, in, in uh, terrible ways uh, in Xinjiang. Let me do one more follow-up with you, Michael, and, and you know, emerging out of that last answer, which is, I mean, obviously that is what human rights and civil rights observers are concerned about, is that if you say something negative about the government, your social credit will decline, and you know, then you can't get access to loans, then you can't get on that flight, then you can't get all of these other things. How concerned are you about that? Um, how concerned? Well, you know, one of, the, one of the strange things about China is that it actually has virtually, it's a growing uh, uh, economic power with virtually no soft power. It's making all kinds of efforts to build soft power, and they're unsuccessful because nobody, nobody, would, nobody wants to go live in a society that controls people in this way. Um, that actually, I think, is a kind of encouraging thing, because I think in the long run, uh, if the Chinese want to uh, continue to develop, continue to globalize, they're going to have to create a model of society that is attractive to other people. And that means a more open society. I don't think it means uh, that we're going to see imminent political transformation, but I do think that over the long run, these sort of nefarious elements of, of, of uh, the Xi regimes, uh, the Xi leadership's uh, um, uh, efforts at social control are going to have to be uh, limited, drawn, uh, brought back. I want to follow up on the political angle with you now, Diana, and that is you've just published a book, Mobilizing Without the Masses. Uh, it's about politics in a country where competition among political parties is not allowed. What kind of politics are possible under such circumstances? Right, so the book is really about how people can coordinate when they're not allowed to. So here in Canada and the United States and a lot of liberal democracies, we are used to doing social change by taking to the streets, right, advocating for change on the streets, for protests, through protests, through strikes, and we have labor unions and other social organizations that enable people to coordinate collective action as such. But in places like China and in other authoritarian states, that's not possible. Mm. It's political suicide for an organization to coordinate people to take to the streets en masse. And so the book really examines, um, based on uh, years of field work in China, examines how people, how organizations are able to exert social change without doing that. And they do so through sending people sending individual people who have uh, grievances with the state one by one to put pressure on the state. And so instead of mobilizing with the masses, as you would imagine social change would happen, you have people mobilizing without the masses, which is the title of my mm -hmm. book. Michael, let me. Uh, apparently we've got a couple of minutes of satellite time with you left, so I want to just uh, pick your brains on one more thing. You are one of many voices who uh, point out the incongruity of a country that clearly has opened up economically while still politically being a very closed shop, can you imagine a country that is more open politically, democratically, open to more voices going forward? Well, David, <clears throat> David's mentioned the example of Taiwan, and I think it's a really, it's a really powerful uh, argument against the idea that Chinese societies or, or Confucian societies uh, are, not, are not suited to uh, democratic politics. The one way of thinking about the last 40 years in China is a series of experiments in what can be accomplished under authoritarianism. And many people in Canada and in the United States predicted that, for example, with the emergence of a middle class, uh, the, the uh, political system would have to change. 
turned out not to be true. China has the world's largest middle class, and they seem to be quite content with uh, an authoritarian regime. Um, the next thing was going to be uh, a modern financial system. You couldn't have a modern banking system and a modern securities uh, system while there was authoritarian political control. Chinese have managed that one as well. The latest is creating an innovation society. Um, and the Chinese do seem to be doing extremely well at fostering a, a, a culture of innovation. Uh, you talked about the 164 unicorns in China. Um, I don't think that would have been imaginable, uh, that we would, have been, we would have been able to imagine that that was possible under an authoritarian political system. So I think that uh, it is unlikely that we are going to see a, a dramatic uh, turnaround in the political situation. Um, I echo probably most political analysts within China in saying a dramatic shift is probably not good for the Chinese or good for the world. Sorry, a dramatic immediate shift, mm -hmm. because that's going to be uh, lead to, to chaos. Um, what I do think is that the Chinese Communist Party is going to have to find a way to incorporate more voices from an ex extremely complex but increasingly complex and diverse society. I think that's the only route for their survival, uh, and I think that's exactly how they're thinking about it. And I am going to put that notion to these two, sadly in your absence, because we're about to lose our satellite feed in about 15 seconds, which gives me enough time, Michael right. Sony at Harvard University, to thank you for being with us on TVO tonight. Apologies for all the technical problems we had getting you in here, but we're so glad that, that you could participate. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Okay, David, pick up on that last comment, if you would. He's saying that there is a day of reckoning coming, that, that China is eventually going to have to allow more voices to bloom, if I can steal a line from a previous decade. What do you think? I, I think that's very true. And I think nobody uh, realizes it more than the, the party itself. And, uh, you know, one of your guests, David Shambaugh, has written eloquently about the party being tremendously adaptive. It's incredible at spotting talent and developing that talent and bringing it to leadership posts throughout the country, listening to what's happening. I think, though, under Xi Jinping, the current president, uh, we've seen um, a, a bit of a, a pause, a slowdown in terms of that, that gradual realization. Xi Jinping is the ultimate party man. He believes in the that the future of China is the future of the Communist Party. So we're seeing a higher degree of repression, controls over universities, media, uh, etc. And the, the problem, the great problem with that is that he postpones, forestalls, delays China's gradual accommodation with more voices. Mm. The longer you put that up, the messier the day and more difficult the day of reckoning will be. And uh, I am not an optimist when I look at China's future. I think that uh, the Communist Party will remain in power for some time, but its end is going to be messy and, and chaotic, which is not good for China, not good for the rest of us precisely because they are, they're forestalling this gradual date with, with destiny and with uh, a more participatory uh, society. There have been a lot of people who have forecast this day of reckoning, and they've all been wrong so far, right? Absolutely, sure. Any, sure. any qualms about putting that out there then? But just as, as worrying would be the contention that the Communist Party will rule forever, right. right? And so I think the end has got to come at some point for the Communist Party, and, and smart communists, I think, would, would agree with that. And smart regimes gradually implement reforms so that the, the transition can be uh, more, uh, more harmonious. Mm -hmm. uh, under Xi Jinping, this is not happening. What would you add to that, Diana? Well, I would add to that that uh, as of this week, China has outlasted the Soviet Union in terms of staying power. So six. Where are we now? Sixty-nine. Sixty-nine years. That's yes, right. Yes. Yes. Sixty-nine and years. Still counting. And every couple of years, <laughs> Chinese political scientists will predict whether China is going to stay or you know what, whether it's going to come to demise. And I'm not going to make that prediction. But I think that the Chinese government is very, very good at adapting and very good at what uh, China's paramount leader Deng Xiaoping used to call crossing the river by groping the stones, moving crossing step by step. Crossing the river by groping the stones. Groping the stones. Yes. That sounds very Deng Xiaoping. All right, we've got a couple of minutes left here, and let's tackle one more thing. What do we as Westerners need to know about China so that we can cope well with this notion of China becoming not just a significant power in the world, but maybe one of the two preeminent powers in the world, you know, looking forward? What would you say, Diana? 
Well, I think the first thing uh, that I tell my students is that just because China is run by a communist party, it doesn't mean that it's culturally communist, right? <laughs> the Chinese people embrace capitalism, they embrace consumerism, they embrace the entrepreneurial spirit. And so I think that we have to be careful when thinking about China as a communist state and thinking that there's somehow an irony or somehow an inherent tension between that and capitalism. I think a lot of Chinese people don't see any sort of inherent uh, tension between communist and capitalism. That ship has sailed, isn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> Does anybody still have the view of, of Chinese people all dressed like Chairman Mao with their little red books? And I mean, that, that image is 40 years out of date. Yes. People don't think that anymore, <laughs> no, do they? No, 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 no. No, they don't. Okay. Uh, okay. Same last question to you, David. What do we need to know as Westerners to help us um, deal with the fact that China is going to be, if not the, certainly one of the preeminent powers in the world over the next half century? I think what we have to figure out is the next strategy for engaging China. The, the globalist vision of, you know, the, at the beginning of this century that if you simply liberalize and engage, uh, China will become more like us has clearly not worked. Mm -hmm. uh, the danger is that now, and, and particularly in the Trump era, we're, we're cr creating walls and barriers. If you look at the technology sector, for example, I think we're in danger of having a bifurcated technology sector. So here in the West, we're worried about Huawei and we're worried about other Chinese technology firms. Uh, in China, uh, companies like Google are struggling to find a foothold. So we, we could have a division in technology that would serve neither, uh, neither side. Right, you, you benefit when you have this, this competition of ideas. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep this competition of ideas going. We have to recognize, as Diana said, that China is diverse. It's not um, monochrome. It's got a variety of views and perspectives, and I, that's one of the things that, that I enjoyed about it. But that we, we need the, the courage and, and indeed the respect to, to confront China, to, to mm -hmm. argue when we, we, to disagree and not to be afraid to disagree. And this, I think, is a particular challenge for Canada. I particularly like what you said before, David. I think you termed um, the phrase China competency, and I think that's exactly what we need. Gotcha. I want to uh, take what time we have left to plug both of your works so that people know what's coming up. David Mulroney, our former ambassador to China, the author of Middle Power, Middle Kingdom. I remember when you were on this program, David, talking about that book, What Canadians Need to Know about China in the 21st century, which is what we're doing all this week. And Diana Fu, you're going to take us through that. You're the political scientist at U of T, author of Mobilizing Without the Masses, Control and Contention in China, also the host of China Here and Now, which is coming up tonight. And we do want to remind everybody to stay tuned to TVO for parts one and two of the four-part series, China the Great Dragon. That's airing right after this program. It is the first in our multifaceted exploration of China, which will air every Tuesday through November, right here on TVO. You can also go to a website, check out all the stuff we've got there about this, tvo.org slash China Here and Now for more information. David, Diana, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.